Hi, I'm Matt here in Michigan. And I'm Reynolds here in Texas. Matt and I have been doing a lot of summer movies, so I thought I was going to change a little bit of course here and do something that's ice cold. We're going to be reviewing Snowpiercer from 2013. This is uh, an interesting film. It stars Chris Evans, Tilda Swinton, Ed Harris, and it's directed by Bon Joon Ho from Parasite and Okta fame. Matt had never seen this film before, so I was really interested to get his take on it. Matt, what did you think of Snowpiercer? All right, so yes, I just saw this for the first time, you know, this last week. And, you know, I heard uh, some good things about this. You know, I knew about the director. I've seen Parasite, and Parasite's a really good movie. So if you haven't seen Parasite, be sure to go check it out. Honestly, to tell you the truth, this movie, I wouldn't say is, is uh, I, it's okay. Let's just put it that way. This movie is just okay. We're going to get into spoilers here. Like I said, this is one of our flashback reviews. So, you know, this movie's been out for a little while, 2013. So we're going to get into some spoilers. But I think a lot of this movie built for the end. Like, it left a lot of things, you know, to be answered at the very end of the movie. And to me, the ending didn't really hit it out of the park. So I guess I'll elaborate on that a little bit more. That was my generalized thinking about this about this movie. That's That's interesting. So for any viewers who are not familiar with this film, the whole premise... And it is based off of a graphic novel. If you're if you're into graphic novels, there is a graphic novel that's based off of a completely different name, though. Uh, the whole premise is that global warming is getting out of hand. And in order to combat global warming, we start engineering our environment. Humans start playing with our environment and they release something into the air that is supposed to bring global warming, uh, climate change, back into control. Uh, now, the person who happens to foresee this being a problem is Wilford and he's the maker of this great luxurious train that's going to circumnavigate the globe it's it's for the high class the high brow well he foresees this problem where the chemicals we're releasing are going to cause earth to go snowball again we we not only stopped global warming and climate change well Hard to say we stopped climate change at that point. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely changed the climate. We definitely changed sure. the climate, yeah. So the Earth goes back into a, a, another ice age, and all of the survivors, at least from what we're told, live on this very long train. It's its own ecosystem, and it circumnavigates the globe once a year. So you can kind of keep track of, of the years as things go by and they've now been on this train for 17 years at the time this movie takes place and there's a lot of stratification there's a lot of class this this movie's got a ton of themes in there and i think that that might be kind of what you're hinting at where you're like you know maybe the ending doesn't pay off on all of those themes yeah like i said the class is the biggest one too because you, we have, you know, the class structure at the front of the train, of course, is the engine and stuff, and you have the wealthiest near the front. And then at the very back, you have people who were not necessarily meant to be on the train. They were stowaways. And now they're all held at the back of the train in, like, horrible conditions. The people at the back of the train, the lower class, are starting this uprising to get to the front of the train to control the engine, basically, to make conditions, you know, better for, for themselves and stuff. Because they see that, you know... Well, the way they're living at, they're having people taken from them. Kids are being taken from them and stuff. And they're being fed these these protein bars kind of thing that kind of look like bars of jello or whatever, just thicker and black and stuff. <laughs> uh. <laughs> they are the poor of the train. They're the, the, the downtrodden. And the thing about them is, from some perspective, they offer nothing to the ecosystem except for kids like they don't work you know they don't have a job on the train to do the train and the engine the engine's a kind of a perpetual motion engine and it just goes you know like no one on this train with very few exceptions actually has jobs and actually works those jobs um so in this film a couple of very standout things for me Chris Evans plays a very off cast. This is after he's been cast as Captain America, you know. He he is part of the back end, the tail section of the train. He's leading the uprising for all intents and purposes. His character's name is Curtis. 
and um, Tilda Swinton, who is playing uh, Minister Mason, and Tilda Swinton is freaking amazing in this movie. I I love Tilda Swinton in this film. Um, and she plays kind of the opposite end of that. She's like the right hand man to Mr. Wilford up in the front of the train, at the engine of the train, as as everything kind of coalesces and comes together. Uh, it's it's certainly it's certainly not perfect, but I I do like the way they've portrayed their characters. Oh, and I forgot John Hurt's in this. Why wow, I completely forgot about that until I recently rewatched it. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right, John Hurt's in this too. And then you get to see how things kind of play out as things go through and they're they're moving their way up this train and things get more and more like, okay, here's the food section, here's the water section, here's the the children learning, learning, quote unquote, you know, kind of kind of giving you some scope of how big this train is. But like, this is this is a really unusual like section of the film. Yeah, it is kind of interesting, too. I, I think that's one thing that was kind of, you know, was kind of different about this film, too, is, like, certain sections they get to, they, they turn into, like, these big kind of, like, battle scenes, gruesome. You know, they're going through certain trains, and some trains they don't really get noticed. Like, people don't really pay that much attention. Other ones they just kind of, like, get, like, stared at kind of thing. Some of the pacing of this movie, I think, changes quite a bit, and they go with, like, the train cars. Like... I think there's a pace change every time we kind of go to like a different car. Like you say, we have the big like fight scene in in one of the cars with the people with like axes and stuff as they're going through the tunnel, and then we'll go through another uh, car. We'll go through where the sushi is made. So I don't know. I thought it was kind of interesting how you know they they all stop and and ate like sushi and stuff like that. It's kind of like I guess it's for them to like taste kind of what the upper class you know, kind of enjoys, even though that is something they say is reserved for just once, you know, a year kind of thing. Tilda Swinton's character says, we only make this sushi once a year. And one of the, the um, characters asks, well, why? Balance. You see, this aquarium is a closed ecological system. She doesn't understand, really, that it's a very delicate situation the ecosystem of the tank, you know, like, like the, having this aquarium, having the fish, and like, if you take out too much, then you won't have this, and if you have to take out just the right amount, and really, Tilda Swinton's character isn't talking about the fish tank, she's talking about the train. She's always, always talking about how everything fits in its, in its right spot, how everything has a place on the train. I, I want to go back and kind of mention, you talked about that, that gruesome, and it is gruesome, it's a, a gruesome axe battle, because the way it's filmed, you can see the flash of genius with this battle. So, like, in this train car with all the axes, there's this first part where it's all daylight and it's all going really well for for the, you know, protagonists as they were, the, the, the bat, the train. And then everything stops. Like, literally, the battle stops because some people bring out a megaphone and they're like, hey, wait, hold on, stop. We're coming up on the bridge, and the bridge marks their one, you know, their their one year. So that's their their new year, basically. Every time they go over this bridge, and they all say "Happy New Year!" Happy New Year! Like they're saying Happy New Year to each other to these people they were just killing. And then you get back to the tension, and they're about to go again. And then Tilda Swinton's character comes out and gives a propaganda speech, and then they go into a tunnel. And then the bad guys are winning because it's dark and they got night vision. And then, and then fire comes and as the light comes again. And I love the constant juxtaposition of that scene between the light and the dark and who's winning the battle at any given time. See, that's the thing too. You say all this stuff too, but at the same time too, part of how that's all changed and stuff is kind of what made it not work for me in this film too. The fact that they are all like fighting, then they all stop for like the one year kind of thing. Like, I, I think it, it's better explained when you say that it, it's a graphic novel. So it makes sense what the source material is. And you can see that everything in this movie is done for a reason. There's a reason for it. But for me, I think the problem is for me, it doesn't actually work. It doesn't feel like a natural thing. It just, it's kind of, for me, it's kind of it takes me out of the film a little bit. Like there's just too much change, even though they are stylized change. I guess for me, the style wasn't for my liking, which I can see this is, 
this is not to say this is not a well done movie. I think it is a well done movie. But artistically, acting is good, story is good and stuff. It just for me, it just didn't all work. It didn't all fit for me. It just it took me out of it a little bit too much. It's it's an interesting thing. I definitely remember the first time I watched this being blown away by this film. I like I really, really liked it. So upon rewatching it, I think it was actually it actually made more sense. Uh, this might be a film that is like a, a watch it more than once kind of movie, and then you're like, okay, I caught this. I didn't catch it the first time or or, or this time around. I definitely like it more upon review as opposed to the first time I watched it. Now, one of the things that that comes after this, quite a ways after this, is eventually. The tail end section, the people who are making it, they're beaten down and there's fewer and fewer of them. And, you know, some get killed here, some get killed here. So you get to the engine bay and there's only like three left, really only one because Curtis is the only tail engine guy. Because the person who's been opening all the doors for them, he's not really from the tail engine. He designed the door systems for this train back in the old world, you know, like, so it's hard to call him a tail ender. But the big shock the big thing that happens at the end is that he gets to the to the engine and wilford says this is all part of the plan your rebellion went better than any past rebellion but basically every once in a while we have to kill off a certain percentage of the population we have to do it quickly because we don't have enough resources and he's explaining it super calm and it's played by ed harris he's just very very in control of the situation and this is when Curtis's character, or well, Chris Evans' character, Curtis, finds out that his idol, someone that he had literally idolized, John Hurt's character, was actually working with Mr. Wilford all along. It's just that this rebellion was supposed to end at that axe battle. That's where that's where everything was supposed to be done. And unforeseen things happened. <laughs> For me, when you say it's very unusual, like, they're walking through the train and all of the changes upon when I review it the second time, I I look at it and I think all these people are kind of in the know. Like Wilford's train is amazing. He, he can let these people know like, Hey, let them pass until this point, And then this is going to happen without any of the tail people knowing about it. That's a big thing too. Uh, the first thing I mentioned was the fact that we had all these elements and, everything was kind of left up to this big reveal. And some things you could kind of, you know, kind of foresee. Like you said, the John Hurt reveal as he was working with Wilford the whole time, it already was kind of hinting that they had some kind of relationship before, and you know that they had some speaking terms already. Um, so to me, that wasn't as big of a shock. I think they just left too much in the movie to question to this very end. And then when they answered it all, it just kind of, I don't know, it just didn't work. Like, there's there's a lot of different questions. One, there's kind of like, all right, what is really Chris Evans' character's motivations? Which we find out what that driving force is right before he enters the engine room at the end. The other thing that we were wondering is, like, where are these little messages coming from? you got to think they're coming from someone in, in, you know, first class or whatever, and possibly is coming from Wilford himself kind of thing. So you have that kind of reveal at the end. What are the kids? That was another thing. Like, why are the kids being taken from the back of the train? Like, that was a big thing, too. We saw them getting, like, measured and stuff. And then you realize at the end that, that you know, these kids were being measured to see that they could actually fit in the engine to, like, repair the engine. Because they need these kids to keep the engine going because, you know, parts that have, like, broken down or whatever, they don't have to make them anymore. So you have to have the kids do this, which was another big reveal at the end. Basically, John Hurt and, and Wilfred Ed Harris' character, they were building up Chris Evans' character, Curtis, to be able to take over for, you know, Wilfred to basically take his place because Wilfred knew that he was getting old and he needed someone to replace him kind of thing. So the whole movie, you're there, everyone's trying to build up Chris Evans' character as, you know, leader. Not just leader of the back of the train, but the leader for the entire train kind of thing. And Chris Evans realized that it requires kids to be in the engine room to keep this going, that it's best for the whole thing to come to a stop than to keep humanity going this way. If you're saying that this is what humans have to be 
in order to keep going, then maybe we shouldn't keep going. Yeah, I actually really liked the, the, the part at the very end with Curtis's character. He's he's almost, you know, almost convinced by Wilford. He's there. He's like, oh my god. You know, everyone who goes to the front is basically brainwashed very fast and because it's so nice up there. It's so luxurious. If you came from the tail end and you went to the front, like, it would be like going from from the streets to a penthouse, you know, in, in modern day terms, scot-free. Would you ever go back to the streets? Really? You know, it isn't until it's revealed that the kids are used to keep the engine going, that Curtis has truly made up his mind and that he's, he's not going to do this. And he would rather burn the whole system down. One of the things that might, that bothers my wife about it is when we re rewatched it is, you don't get a necessarily a couple, only two scenes really where the train shows off its true scale, its true size. You know, you walk through a, you know, the aquarium tank and you're like, well, yeah, but really for 10,000 humans, you would need like five aquarium sections or water sections. You know, you would need 20 greenhouse sections and you don't really see the size of the train in the novel and in the movie, or even even the new TV series, it's like it's a thousand cars long. And you don't really see the scale of the train uh, in this movie. Another thing that they're kind of like building up to was this this drug that supposedly the first class has, and that's the main reason that you know the guy that designed the doors and his daughters are helping them open all these doors is for this this drug kind of thing, which they're going to use it for another purpose at the end. They're actually going to use it for explosives. But you hear that everyone in first class is kind of like addicted to that stuff. And that is kind of like another theme that they're trying to touch on this one on kind of like using drugs to basically subdue the first class that basically no one on this train, I don't think is really living there. Maybe there's just too many themes for me in this movie. And that might be another thing too. Do you like our big theme is on class and how there's, you know, it's a complex issue and there's a lot of layers to it. Well, maybe it's not streamlined enough. Maybe there's just too too many. And like you said, too, is like you enjoyed this more after the second viewing kind of thing. And so that's one of those that you need to unpack more and more to go over. But to me, I don't think a lot of times you rewatch movies is because they leave you with questions. Or you're like, oh, well, I want to see something I didn't see before. But sadly, I don't know that I actually want to see this movie again to unpack more. And I think that's a real shame. That's fair. I mean, hey, we can't agree about every movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's for sure. But um, then we get to the very, very, very end of the film. Um, there's a big, large explosion, which Matt had alluded to. It's the drug that's used. It's kind of just a compound that happens to have... Incredible explosive capabilities. The train derails. There's a huge avalanche. Like the whole shebang. This this is it. This is the end. There's two characters, you know, crawling out of the train. A young kid and the doormaster's daughter. They see a polar bear, and it's like, okay, all this time you're led to this illusion that everything that survived, or at least humans, everything every human that survived survived and they're on this train but there's a polar bear right there so like if if polar bear survived if other creatures survive it's possible there's humans besides this train it, it kind of gives you that last bit of hope at the very end like if life survived outside of the train there might be more than just this train and now the train's gone so um in my typical find a way to fix a Star Trek reference into something like, I like that it ends on hope, you know, like a lot of good Star Trek does. I like that Snowpiercer ends on, on, on this kind of happy, like there is hope out there in this world. Possibilities. There's definitely a possibility that life could go on and stuff outside this train that this isn't, you know, like as we were talking about, this whole train, the whole idea that what Wilford was trying to convince Curtis was, this is what we need to do to keep humanity going. 
And, you know, Curtis brought the train to a halt. And, you know, these two people survive, get off the train and realize, well, no, that isn't what we need for humanity to to continue on. There is still, you know, hope, you know, a chance that humanity is going to continue on. This is this is definitely a different film. Uh, I haven't watched anything of the TV series. So if you've been watching the TV series and you've seen this film, let us know what you think below in the comments, please, because. I'm interested a little bit in the TV series, but it looks very different from this movie. We have lots of flashback movie reviews. Make sure to go check them out on our channel. Give us a like and a subscribe and ring the bell icon if you always want to see what we are going to be posting. You can also hit us up on our Facebook page. For now, I'm Randall here in Texas. Everyone have a great day. And I'm Matt here in Michigan. See you guys next time on No Market Media. Please consider checking out some of our other videos.